the Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network presents The Kingdom Driven Family Podcast with your host, Andrea Schwartz. This podcast will equip and empower you to help advance Christ's kingdom through God's primary institution, the family, building a home that serves Christ and His kingdom. Hi there, this is Andrea Schwartz along with my co-host Nancy Wilk for another edition of Homeschooling Help. And we are on the second to the last segment of our Curriculum Foundation series. Hey, Nancy, how you doing? I'm doing good, Andrea. How about yourself? Good, good. good. Now we're going to do a little bit of technical stuff here. Since Nancy right. happens to live right near a train that goes yeah. by on unscheduled times, she doesn't exactly know when, she's going to let me know when a train's coming, and I have figured out how to mute her for that moment in time um, in order to not have everybody hear the train, and then she's going to give me a thumbs up to say, it's okay, um, I can talk again, but hopefully right. not like last week where we had, what, two or three trains? I'm not exactly sure. Right. The train. The trains don't ask our permission when to come, so... All right, so I'll tell you when it comes, when I start hearing the bell, and um, when it passes, I'll give you a thumbs up, okay? That sounds good. All right, so um, our topic today is where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. And I looked that up. It came out of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and, you know, what is what does that have to do with our, our homeschool curriculum you know that seems like talking about the law the letter of the law and you know what does that have to do with our with our curriculum okay well good i i challenged you and you usually know exactly what i'm going to talk about well if you look at the beginning of this series right we talked about identifying who god is that god is three persons in one god and we spent time talking about the father, the creator, the sustainer. And we talked about Jesus as our redeemer. And so it was time to talk about the Holy Spirit. And as a good friend likes to say, the Holy Spirit has probably the least appealing job of the Trinity in as much as he has to indwell people who are not fully sanctified. So uh, the Holy Spirit lives inside us as believers, but not fully sanctified believers. So there's still a lot of mess, right? Yeah, right, right. If we don't identify the need for the Spirit of God, let's go to the fact that if someone does not have the Spirit of God, he or she is not born again. And in our day and age, being born again has been so trivialized that you can have people doing all sorts of things that are wholeheartedly contrary to God's word. And yet people are going to say, well, he's a Christian. He's a Christian. What, you know, well, Jesus made it really clear. He basically said, you must be born again. And that didn't mean go out and effort, find that way to be born again, pay for it, um, hang around with the right people. He was stating you must the same way that we'd say, you need air to live. You need air to breathe. You need food to sustain yourself. You need liquid. He wasn't telling people to go out and effort at something. He was telling them, this is a reality that has to happen. Mm -hmm. And and really, you know, there's some, some part of that being born again that we, as the first time I didn't have anything to do with me being born the first time. I don't have a lot to do with me being born the second time. So that's something that ha that God that God does in us, not something that we can make happen. Right. And you had nothing to do with being conceived. Right. You did probably have something to do with being born. You got big and tight in there and, and it was like time to get out. So you started a process. Right. But right. in truth, we have less to do with being born again in the spirit than we did about being born. Okay. The first time around. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that means that genuine Christianity, there is the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's the difference between 
the heart of stone and the heart of flesh. Now, right. let me tell you the trap homeschooling parents, but mostly moms, since I'm familiar with that, get into is that there's so much opposition, usually with family or friends. Why would you homeschool? Um, you can do much more with your life and just stay home with your kids, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. That they feel they have to justify their decision by having the shiniest, brightest, best behaved children that there are because you have to validate this decision because they have a wrong sense of who the audience is. Mm -hmm. okay, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. So what do we tend to do? And I can say we, cause I fell into this myself. We tend to work on the externals as opposed to the internals. So you have a child who doesn't care one bit as to whether or not he or she is conforming to what you want. And then you have another child that goes out of his or her way to do everything you ask. Mm -hmm. How do you know which one has the spirit of God within him? The one that's, that's, that's doing what's, what's right. Maybe. Did I miss something? What, what, okay. Tell maybe, me. maybe, maybe you have maybe. one that's just ornery and doesn't care. And maybe you have another that has gotten very good at mirroring back what you want. True. Mm -hmm. Saying what you want them to say instead of really uh, right. being, being self-governed, being, uh, being led by the spirit of God. Right. And so like that parable of the two sons and the father tells one, go out and plow the field. And he says, I'm not going to do it. And the other one says, okay, I'll do it. But the one who said he wouldn't do it is the one who went out and did it. And the one who said he would do it didn't go out and do it. So we're supposed to judge by actions. We're supposed to judge by the fruits. And just because somebody is manifesting sinfulness and the other one has kind of figured out or is just a kind of personality that doesn't like to make waves, it's a wrong conclusion to assume that that person is on board when the other one isn't. So we're talking about having the spirit of the Lord being present. Now, if the spirit of the Lord isn't present in you, you're going to have a really difficult time conveying any of this to your children. Sure. And, and one of the problems is because a lot of people think that the spirit of the Lord, they confuse the spirit of the Lord with their own human spirit, their own, um, their own desires. And so we have to make sure that we understand that the spirit of the Lord is always, um, it, it is, is, is never contrary to the word of God. Right. right. And that the Holy Spirit gives us the strength to obey, not just um, not just a happy heart. Right. Because we'll know the fruit of the spirit is what emerges out of people who have the spirit. That's why we call it the fruits of the spirit. Mm -hmm. Right. In other words, this is what someone looks like when the Holy Spirit is directing their actions. And so one of the most important lessons in teaching people, whether you're teaching historical events or facts having to do with anything else that's in the curriculum, you have to make sure you convey that there's no way to gussy up and sanitize a sinful nature. We can't make it look better, put nice clothes on it and expect it's going to be okay. It has to be eradicated. It has to go away. All right. You can dress the pig up, put lipstick on him and put him in a parlor, but it's still a pig. Exactly. So how does that factor into the curriculum and how does it factor into the idea of liberty? Well, most people today don't understand what liberty is. They right. have it confused with a lot of other things. Right. Right. And confuse liberty with license. And it's right. that is not liberty in the Lord. And that's not the Holy Spirit that does that. I have some really well-meaning brothers and sisters um, in the Lord who have a great concern for my, my interest in the law of God and perceive that as being somehow 
you know, the law, their perception is that the law constricts us rather than understanding that the law gives us freedom. And so we don't want to look at, at God's words and God's law as restricting, but proper um, liberty. Well, let's be real. It is restricting. If I get mad at my husband, I am restricted according to God's law from doing him in. I'm not allowed to do that. Sure. Right? That would be wrong. Right. Um, if my husband got tired of me for whatever reason and then decided to go out and find somebody else. So by all means, the law restricts us. The question is, are you submitting to the yoke of Jesus or are you buckling and deciding, I don't want your yoke. My yoke is just fine. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that? Well, you have to be real with your children. You have to be real about who you are, who you were prior to being born again. And again, you have to let your children know it's not because you were so great or you were so smart. It's because God invaded your sinfulness because he had chosen you. Right. So it's appropriate to teach your children early on about the doctrine of election. Some people would say, oh, you wanted some children to worry about whether or not they'll be saved? Maybe. We're told to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. If we don't have a healthy fear of God, then maybe we think we can do it on our own. Mm -hmm. So if we want liberty, we have to understand that liberty only comes by means of the spirit. The spirit has to be there. And it's a recognition that we have to stop deciding for ourselves right and wrong, which is how we were all born. Mm -hmm. And then we have to submit to the authority of Christ. So your, your, your well-meaning brothers and sisters either have one of two things going on. Either their theology is bad, but they don't necessarily live out that bad theology, or their theology is that bad, and maybe they're in the process of being converted, mm -hmm. or maybe, like what I suggested earlier, they understood maybe early on that if you look a certain way, then you're the genuine article. Right. Right. Whereas in Corinthians, one of the things that that in the context of that verse, it is talking about the external, um, the external appearance of doing right versus the um, a circum the the circumcised heart, the the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. And that those law that that law needs to be not just an external, uh, an external thing, but but written on our hearts. So how do we how do we know if though if the law of God is written on our hearts and that the Holy Spirit is the only one that can do that? Exactly. And the letter of the law isn't bad. It's just not sufficient without the spirit. That's why the law never saves anybody. Because if, if you could, if all you had to do is follow the law, which of course you can't because we all inherited Adam's sin. But if you could, Jesus wouldn't have had to come take on human form and go through his life and his death. So right. this is where theology is important. And don't try to whitewash it so you can tell your friends in the Bible study that all six of my children are Christians. Uh, all six of my children might be being discipled, but the reality is you don't know until there's an opportunity to do otherwise. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I remember um, a, a an illustration that that um, I heard some time ago, and that is if you had a had a freshly mopped kitchen floor and you tell one of your kids, don't go in the kitchen. I just mopped the floor. You're going to have one that's going to, you know, thumb their nose at you and go right into the middle of the kitchen floor and dare you to do different. There'll be another one who will just see just how close, uh, how close up they can get to that kitchen floor and just barely touch it and see if you call them on it. In both cases, the one that is just barely on the edge and the one that's, you know, drying it with their 
belly, daring you to pull them off of it. They both, both of them, while one of them is, you know, demonstrating a little bit of no, and the other one is screaming no, their hearts are both wrong. You know, and there's that third child. And I I had three kids and I had all three that were like Mm -hmm. this. I mean, had each different category. And then there's the kid who is so afraid of disapproval of mommy or daddy that stays away from that floor. And you have to encourage the child. Okay, it's okay to walk on the floor now. Yeah. No, as opposed to you may never walk on the floor because that's how a lot of Christian professing Christians deal with potential abuse of alcohol. I just won't drink Mm -hmm. at all. All right. That doesn't make them holy. That that's not it. Right. Any more than we'd say, well, if I'm a glutton that I just won't eat it all. Well, we have to understand what's the proper way to do various things. Mm -hmm. And I like to tell moms, especially when they are, are running into problems with their children. And I get to have the privilege of helping people through this is that while children are living in your home, you can control their behavior and their speech to a degree. To a degree. Because those are evident, right? So you, and there's going to be a sanction for violation of the rules. You will never be able to control their thoughts ever. And yet right. that's where sin has its breeding ground. Mm-hmm. So you inform their thoughts. You disciple them in the scripture. You use the law as a function of tutor that is going to lead them to Christ. Right. 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 And having because be- that, when the Holy Spirit visits them and they are truly born again, that law is there. And now there is the impediment of not following it gone. Their sinful nature has been replaced with the Holy Spirit and life after that is basically a cleanup operation. Yeah, because they can be sitting down physically, but standing up on the inside. And so this um, this uh, recognize and learning to recognize the Holy Spirit and the need for uh, the Holy Spirit in our salvation, sanctification and discipling pro- process, um, that is his work. If we don't recognize that, then we'll we'll settle for the kids that are sitting down on the outside and they'll never learn how to deal with the one that's standing up on the inside. Right. And one of the reasons that public school, I mean, there are lots of reasons why we don't advocate children being sent to public schools if they're Christian, is that boys and girls are very different. And the girls tend to be the ones who want to please the teacher. And so the boy who's acting like a boy in this culture is deemed inappropriate and that the effort is to make him more like a girl. Mm. When in actual fact, you're getting a much clearer representation of someone who can't control himself by the fact that he gets up and down, doesn't, you know, and, and, and doesn't listen to every directive I remember telling a mom whose child was flunked in kindergarten, how you do that, I don't know, but he was flunked because he liked to stand up while the teacher was teaching. And so I encouraged her, you should homeschool because you know what? You can learn your times tables standing up. You can learn them kneeling down. You can learn them on a chair, right? Right. Here we had this external that was being the deciding force as to whether or not someone was learning. Right. Yeah, I see. I see where you're going with that. And um, that takes a lot of, it takes discernment. It takes a willingness to, to recognize what it, you know, first of all, who's the Holy Spirit? What's he doing? Um, and, and give him that, um, his way in our house and not demand these externals that we really can't control and aren't proven anything, you know? Right. Right. It's about it, we, and I, I do see that our curriculum in our curriculum, we need to be mindful of what God requires of us and teach our children to be self-governing. Um, not because we can condition their behavior or manage their, con- their behavior externally, but because these are the things that God requires of us and only until they control the proper direction. 
Right. Until they control themselves, they will have external control. That's part of what being a parent means. Sure. And nobody should be confused that this is an easy job, especially for the mom. It's not. Yeah. Right. But like you said, there might be a kid who's a, who's afraid to go on the wet floor now. You may have conditioned them to the external. We had a little puppy dog that, that we taught him not to go on the carpet. But it wasn't that he couldn't walk on the carpet, but he had to be trained for for a season to know to know when to go outside appropriately. You know, so so to get the bigger picture and purpose and the spirit of the of the law, what is it that God's after here and not just an external conformity to whatever we think the tradition or the expectation our our expectation of that right like sitting in the classroom you know sometimes boys are easier to deal with than girls just because they'll fight and get it over with and you know really what you're dealing with instead of the girls they'll go sit in the corner and you know color their picture but it'll be angry for weeks you know right right exactly so that's why the major aspect of homeschooling from a biblical godly perspective isn't how many tests are passed, how many books are finished, uh, what grade level someone's in. It's the right. effort to build the character and communicate a worldview. And this would be hard enough if you just had one child. Take families that have two, three, four, five, six. Uh, some of the ladies I have the privilege of mentoring are up to nine, 10 or 11. Right. Yeah. So how do you do that? Mm -hmm. How do you actually determine what's happening with each kid as opposed to figuring, well, the quiet ones are good. We have to focus our attention. You know, this is my recommendation to moms of big families. And I hope the dads would be listening. Okay. What your wife does as the primary educator of the children in academics is really just a further progression of what she does as a mother, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So don't look at your wife's value as she cooks, she cleans, she um, makes sure that they're bathed uh, and that the house is in good order. Those are all important. But especially moms of big families, you need to actually schedule time with each child, especially the older ones, right? whether it's you leave somebody home as you go grocery shopping and you and a particular child go out and run that errand together and you spend the time talking and, uh, you know, so what did you learn? What do you think? So that you have some time to flesh out who your child is. I'm not advocating don't have a big family, but you can find other people to do some of that work. Now, granted, if they're all young, you can't have the two-year-old make the food. But by the time you have a nine or 10 year old, that nine or 10 year old could have been taught how to prepare dinner because mom's got the, the scheduled time with a particular child. And managers do this in corporations and businesses all the time. If you don't know your employees, how will you know if they're struggling? How will you know if they're cheating? How will you know if they're causing disruption with everyone else if you don't take the role as the manager who finds out? Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> when we start, um, you know, when you're only looking at the externals of things, that's one of the problems that people have with, um, <clears throat> excuse me, like with the um, public schools, if they're not in that external box of conformity, it's too easy just to give them a pill, you know, and settle them down and, and, and give them a diagnosis or, or, or something like that. But, but really, you know, we have to recognize that that um, when we talk about liberty in the spirit, we're not talking about license, but we are talking about the, um, the uh, properly to let these in, let these individuals learn and be governed by the spirit of God that knows these things in ways that we can't even touch and see. Um, one of the things that we used to do with our older kids um, was instead of just saying, what are you learning? You know, 
um, we did um, Proverbs. We'd read Proverbs and a chapter of Proverbs each day and ask them if there was one particular verse that, that came to their attention. In doing that, we let the Holy Spirit tell us what he was putting his fingers on in their life. So there's ways to do this. And, um, and, and there's liberty in doing that. You know, I, I've, one of the things that is encouraging to me, and I want to remind folks, and that is what our homeschools look like are going to be as individual as our families, as individuals, as individualized as our children. There's some things that are going to be the same. God's law governing us. But how you, what the externals of that looks like in terms of which book or what time or sitting down or standing up, that is all, that's that's all external stuff that that we don't have to keep measure of necessarily. Right. Now, I always like to anticipate the objectors, the person who go, oh, yeah, but what about this? So sure. what about the fact that if you're a home educator and you aren't grounded in biblical law and you don't really know the ins and outs of how it applies? Well, well if that's excuse me, if that's the case, you only know what you know. And so a wise person, if, if that's where you are right now listening to us, you would be wise to seek counsel for yourself because we really do only only know how we've been taught. And for a lot of us, that was just to bring the public school home. So right. Right. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I had to interrupt no, you there. Because, you know, we have right. listeners that are coming at the very beginning of this. Their kids are getting diagnosed at school because they're a little boy and they want to play instead of sitting down and coloring appropriately. So just saying, there you go. And sure. Just about coloring. I have a granddaughter who, when she was in kindergarten, we asked her, how do you like school? And she looked at us very straight faced and she says, there's just way too much coloring. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, my daughter, um, we started my daughter in homeschool and then there was situation change. She, you know, we sent her to school. We didn't see any other option. And the at first day home, she said it was dull and boring, you know. Yeah. Right. So to the mom who's new at this, start yeah. studying. Don't expect your children to listen to you in terms of the subject matter you want them to learn if they don't see you learning as well. And that's why I formulated the Calcedon Teacher Training Institute, which you can access at no charge at mm -hmm. ctti.org. The purpose is to get started. I guarantee you, you read the introduction to Rush Dooney's book, Institutes of Biblical Law. It will give you plenty of food for thought and you'll immediately be able to apply what does it mean to have no other gods before me in the first commandment. You'll understand how to convey that to your children. And it's a lifelong pursuit. So the fact that it doesn't happen instantly and you don't have the gratification that you now have become an expert in the law, I've been doing this for over 20 years and I'm certainly better than I was when I started, but I would need to be a whole lot more into it, which I do, to become an expert. And that's what we as Christians need to be in terms of telling people, okay, why is our society a mess? Why are there things that you don't like and you don't know how to change? Well, it's all laid out in the word of God. And once you start learning from that perspective, you'd be amazed at the blessings that come upon you as an individual and your home school and your family in general. And we will stand out. We will be the city on the hill and the salt and the light, but not if we don't apply the, the prescription that we've been given in scripture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I don't think that we will ever become experts in this in our own lifetime. But one of the things that the scripture talks about in terms of um, salvation, when we are born again, there is that real um, turning in our life. And it's like if we were if I was driving down the road and realized that I wasn't going the direction that I wanted to, I would take the next exit. 
You know, we know how to do that on the road. And the Bible calls that repentance. And so if you're coming to this new and you realize that there's stuff that's just not the way it's supposed to be, just just take the exit, you know, turn around. And there is blessing in that, you know, there really is blessing in that. We don't want to keep going the wrong way uh, necessarily after God shows us that we need a that we need to turn around. Exactly. And these, you know, Tuesday gatherings are meant to start scratching the surface, whet your appetite. Both Nancy and I are available. All you have to do is on the comment section, say, I, or a private message. We're both on Facebook. You know, could you, could I set up a time to talk with you? And it's one of the things we both love to do. It's not that you'd be bothering us. We both hope people will do that. Right. So Andrea, just to give folks a little bit of a, um, you know, um, again, a kind of our individual history, you all, you homeschooled your kids all the way through, right? Yes. And um, I did not, you know, I've done the single mom thing. My kids were homeschooled. They were in public school. We took teenagers out of school. And, uh, you know, so between the two of us, we have a lot of, um, a lot of varied experience. And um, I've also been um, seeing this statistic a recommendation actually that if you are just coming out of um, a public school system to homeschool that you might need a, a month or more for every year that you, your kids have been in, in um, that very, very structured environment just to get your breath and to, to reunite as a family and take the time to make that exit and turn around together to see what God would have for you. Because there is blessing in that. And just because there are bumps in the road or it's difficult doesn't mean that's a good reason to abandon ship. Um, I consider right. the ultimate abandoning ship is sending your children to a godless place that will make sure that they never hear the truth of Scripture. That's the worst form of abuse there is, because in the end, they're going to be living the lie. And as you put it, instead of looking at liberty as the desired goal, they look at license and security as the uppermost. And that's why they let an elite group of people, you know, lead them around because they can't think the way God created them to think. Yes, man fell, but God still gave us the capacity to know him. And the book of Romans says, we're all out without excuse. We know right and wrong. So no matter what they've learned about abortion or feminism or homosexuality, they know. How do I know they know? Because the Bible says they know. The Bible says we do. Yeah. Yeah. All right, friend. Well, I see we've chatted for a half an hour and plus some. No train. We had no train no today. Train. Praise the Lord. Can you believe that? There was, I don't, there was so many last week. So. Right. All right. Well, now we have a plan anyway. So right, for next, plan, next time. Okay. Next we'll see you next time. Very good. Thank you, Andrea. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining Andrea Schwartz and the Kingdom Driven Family Podcast. Holding up the family and self-government as a true and lasting means of transforming society. Please visit thekingdomdrivenfamily.com and reconstructionistradio.com.